Our first panelist is Frank Bruno. Footnote, when I started practicing law, Frank Bruno was my first client. Thank you, Frank. For, for, formed a printing company and uh, was very successful in business and, and now leading Volusia County Council as its chairman. He also serves as chairman of the Central Florida Congress of Regional Leaders, an important program that is part of the Central Florida Partnership. Also on this panel is my mayor, Buddy Dyer, the mayor of the city of Orlando, who obviously played an instrumental role in the passage of the Florida Rail Transit legislation and served as chairman of the, of the Community Rail Commission for Central Florida. Uh, and next, our good friend from Osceola County, former Representative John Quinones, who serves as the Osceola County Commissioner, just uh, past chairman of that commission, past chairman of Metro Plan, the Metropolitan Planning Organization of Osceola and Orange and Seminole Counties. And then our facilitator, Mark Brewer. Mark is the president and CEO of the Community Foundation, whose mission is to build community by building philanthropy. Mark's involvement in the Central Florida nonprofit sector spans more than two decades. He's also a founding member of the Central Florida Partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in saying thank you and expressing our appreciation to these leaders for taking time to participate in this meeting. And Mark. <laughs> Mark, your first question, please. All right, good morning. And my morning. first question goes to you, Mayor Dyer. As you put on your regional hat and take a look at the issues, the regional issues that are out there now that will impact our ability to stay competitive in the business sector, what are the most important regional issues we face? Well, I can think of several, but since we're on a theme of transportation, <laughs> um, I'll start with that one. And certainly, uh, I believe that the piece of legislation that was put forward by the delegation and the entire legislature is a game changer, not just the SunRail. Piece, but setting a framework for a transit system, a high-speed rail system throughout the whole state of Florida. That's a first step. We need to go get the money to do that. We also need to think about freight rail, or freight rail and uh, moving goods around the state. So I think being competitive, you have to have a great transportation system. So again, we took a step towards that. Um, a second area that I would say is collaboration. And I'm going to hit two things I already hit in the first Thing. But if you think about all the great successes we've had, whether it was the uh, creation of the medical school or boring the Burnham Institute here, getting the VA hospital, the community venues, certainly the commuter rail, it couldn't have happened if it was just the city of Orlando doing it or just UCF doing it or just the private development interest doing it. It was because we put aside old, petty jurisdictional differences and came together for the good of the entire community and entire region. Um, I'm going to hit two more real quick so I don't take everybody's time, but diversifying our economy um, is important, and I think if you ask every elected official in this room what's the most important issue moving Central Florida forward, it's going to be diversifying our economy. The medical city, we, it builds off of two great hospital systems that we have. Digital media is coming into its own in Central Florida, so those are three areas I'd say are very important. Very good. So the economy is different, the world's different, but we are still in a growth mode and competitiveness is still important. Commissioner Quinones. Thank you. And first, it's uh, great to be among uh, what I consider friends. And uh, I miss serving, but I don't miss it that much. I know you guys <laughs> um, have uh, a tough, tough challenge ahead. Um, as I was driving here, uh, I will answer this by saying, but as I was driving here, I do, as I do every morning, I take my kids to school. and. On the way, I saw um, great construction going on in Osceola Parkway and John Jong, and, and it reminded me, you know, we have poured a lot of money into the infrastructure. Um, in Osceola County, about $200 million of uh, impact fees. And same thing with Orange County. So to me, in times like we're experiencing today, when cost is uh, low, construction costs, best thing we can do to remain competitive is pour money into the infrastructure. And that's something that, that we're doing locally. And then as I'm driving 417, and I see on the right uh, Medical City, I see on the left um, the uh, Orlando International Airport, Airport I, I'm reminded that we have to concentrate on the industries that we do have, develop them, the existing industries. So I'm reminded that we have potential on the international tourism area. I'm reminded that um, Medical City, of course, is gonna be um, what uh, is gonna bring us into the next 
phase of, of our development. And then I'm reminded of the space industry. You know, a developing industry, a one that really was a game changer in the 60s, in the 70s, and one that we need to protect because it's a high paying wage uh, industry. And so I continue to drive and I exit Colonial. And again, I'm reminded of what Orange County and the region is doing in infrastructure. But then I arrive here, world class education. And I say, to remain competitive, we have to support our education. We have to support our community colleges. Our uh, uh, Valencia Community College is experiencing enormous registrations, and now, you know, obviously uh, where we are today. So bring that as a package, and I think um, we just need to develop and continue to develop what we have, our in existing industries, our infrastructure, our international tourism, our medical city, and of course our education. And as I go back, I will be reminded of those same issues again when we go back into the area of Osceola County and we see the airport over there that also needs to be um, an area that needs to be uh, explored for diversifying our economy. So uh, that's what I would uh, give you uh, legislators. I know you're gonna have your, your hands full with class size, with Medicaid, with all the issues with the budget, but understand that uh, we're, we also need to just be left in an area where we can govern locally and try to uh, develop those areas that are so crucial to the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Gentlemen, just a reminder to work the mic so our gallery members can hear you. You may have to get a little closer to the mic. And Chairman Bruno, from your perspective. Well, thank you, Mark. Before I answer that question, I want to say it's really an honor for me to be here in front of all of you today. And thank you for all assembling to hear from us today. It's also an honor um, to be representing the seven counties, the, uh, the 87 cities um, in Central Florida. And you know, we keep leaving out the school boards. I also, as chair of the Congress of Regional Leaders, we represent uh, also the seven school boards. And education is so important um, to the Central Florida area and to the state and to our nation. So I wanted to kind of say, mention that. We have a shared vision uh, for Central Florida. And in your packets, you'll see some information on that through my region. And there's actually four focuses of attention uh, there, and that's conservation. Um, countryside, centers, and corridors. And I'm going to speak on uh, conservation in a little while, but you know, um, I think the most important thing is everybody working together in the Central Florida area. That's what really uh, will mean um, progress for the Central Florida area. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Quinones, Amendment 4. When you think about Amendment 4, what impact does that have on economic prosperity? Well, very, very simply, I, I look at it from um, a constitutional standpoint. We are a representative type of government. Um, we are elected to obviously represent uh, those who elected us. And so to me, those are crucial decisions that need to be made um, at this local level in, in, as a commissioner, as a representative of those people that uh, elected me. Um, and uh, quite frankly, it's just going to um, hamper the, uh, the process. Um, I understand why people are frustrated. We had unprecedented growth in the last decade in Central Florida. Osceola County was the uh, second fastest growing county in the state for many, many years. And so people are frustrated because we were playing catch up. But what they need to realize is that now's the time that we're actually developing and, and doing those things that really we should have been doing um, a decade ago building the infrastructure, um, putting the resources in our education system. And so um, it's going to take an educational component for the constituents to understand that um, we need to be left to govern, which is what they allow us and gave us the honor to do when they elected us. You know, one of the things Central Florida has done pretty well is understood that the three sectors, public, private, and the community-based organization sector, have to work together to make things happen. Mayor Dyer, you heard Dr. Hitt talk about the great collaborations and the things that have been done to create partnerships between local and state and across those three sectors. What do you see as a key in the future in terms of partnerships for our economic development and growth? Well, I, I think it's a different way of thinking, and I think Central Florida is ahead of the game 
in terms of how we have approached this. It's no longer Orlando competing against Sanford or Kissimmee or Volusia County competing against Seminole County. We've recognized that as a region, we can do great things. We can compete against Singapore or Hong Kong instead of having regional differences. And um, the other recognition is that government can't do it by itself. Um, the not-for-profit sector can't do it by itself. There's strength in bringing those partnerships together. And we can cite example after example, whether it's um, the group effort that brought the UCF Medical School here. I thought I would never see such a community-wide effort until after that we did the Burnham, and after that we did the community venues, and after that we did SunRail. So I think it's become a, a way that we achieve and get things done in Central Florida. On this uh, same subject of collaboration, Chairman Bruno, it's not often that you would use the words conservation or environment in the same context with business, business growth and economic development, but in Central Florida, we've had that happen, and you've been a part of it. Tell us a little bit about Forever Florida. Absolutely, and I think uh, Forever Florida is something that's very important, especially now when we have an opportunity to buy properties at, the, at a reduced price. Um, just recently, you know, we were talking about the uh, Volusia Corridor, which is one of the seven jewels of the state of Florida, and you know that goes down into Bavard County as well from Volusia County, and you know. It behooves all of us to work together to acquire a lot of this conservation land. Um, I can't say enough about the uh, Florida Forever program because we were able to leverage Volusia Forever money to be able to acquire 33,000 acres in the center of our county, preserve that, and also have an opportunity to protect our water supply at the same time. And you know, we're talking at the Congress of Regional Leaders how we could work together um, to make sure that we have water resources for the future. And, and the only way we're going to do that is by uh, having the land available that we can have the resources available. And that's something that we're working on as a region, but it needs to be statewide. Very good. Now, Representative Senators, I don't want to leave you out of this discussion, so I would offer an opportunity for you to ask the panel a question. Does anyone have a question on their mind that you'd like to share with this group? for a response? Then let me let you consider for a minute <laughs> as I move forward and ask the three of you now about collaboration at the regional level from your perspective. We've talked a little bit about different kinds of collaboration, but as we move forward, when you're sitting with this group thinking regionally and statewide, what key collaborations need to happen over the next five years that will make a difference not just on the business side, but also on the civic side. And specifically, I want you to think a little bit about the civic side of this, because the quality of life in communities depends on all three sectors working together. What kind of collaboration would you like to see happen? And would you suggest that these folks be thinking about as they go back to Tallahassee? I'm going to just open and skip the civic part for a second, okay. but go right to the collaboration that we need to have with our legislative delegation. Right. And I think this type of forum is extremely good, but having the interconnection and making sure that our priorities are your priorities and your priorities are our priorities. Um, again, the just completed legislative session is a great example of that, but sometimes you go to other regions in the state and certainly other places around the country, and there's a total disconnect between what the local governments are thinking about and then what their delegations are doing, but I actually think we have a good collaboration, better than most areas around the state, and it's important that we foster that and keep it going. Very good. Anyone I, else? I, th I really agree with Buddy Dyer. I think it's important for you to understand where we are as counties and cities, and to um, and, and I'm going to go back to the Forever program because I know that it wasn't funded last year, and I think it needs to be funded, especially because of the fact that you need to understand what the local governments are trying to do, and we need your help in trying to leverage our money to to obtain more of this conservation land. I, I hate to to keep beating the dead horse here, but what I'm I'm really saying to you is. Um, just recently in Volusia County, we had an opportunity to pick up about 3,300 acres of land. That land just a year ago was worth $40 million. We partnered with the St. John's River Water Management District. It would have been nice to have the Forever Program as well so that we can leverage some more money. But we were able to acquire that $40, 000, $40 million um, 
is worth of property for only $20 million. And it costs um, Volusia County like $6 million. What the situation is today is that all of our, um, our budgets are really tight. There's more demand on county government than um, ever before, and we have less revenue coming in. But the only way we're going to move ahead is by partnering. We're partnering with all of our municipalities um, throughout the region, and um, we need you to partner with us. Great example of collaboration, well, Commissioner Fignani. Just briefly, sometimes tough times brings us closer together. I think this is a prime example. Um, thanks to Jacob Sewer, um, the, uh, the My Region effort. I don't think this region has ever been so close. Uh, Sunrail, I think, was the end result of that. Um, you saw the dele delegations, how, how fractured they were on the issue, um, as opposed to this delegation and, and on this particular issue. And, and so it was galvanizing in a way how, uh, you know, and so we need to do more of that. Well, let's not forget how we got there and see if we can uh, do that on, on certainly other issues. So on the theme of collaboration and opening the door that Mayor Dyer opened, I'll come back to the delegation to see if there's a question about issues or challenges that you see. Senator? If I could, I, I think one issue that is important, especially when we talk about the business climate or economic climate change we have to be talking about is Amendment 4. There are a lot of reservations that people have with this amendment, how it could stifle economic opportunity across our state. Maybe if the facilitators would like to comment on Amendment 4. Great. We had a comment from uh, Commissioner Quinones, Mayor Dyer. Well, the city of Orlando is officially on record as opposing Amendment 4, and I think it will make things very difficult in terms of future development if you have to vote on every comp plan amendment or a a put it out for referendum after the city council has voted to adopt it. The city of Orlando is actually in a little bit better shape than most because we have pretty um, dense comp plan uh, areas already and can accommodate a variety of uses but some of the outlying areas um, why would you purchase that and think you're going to develop it in some time in the future with such uncertainty um, and I think it's going to be extremely stifling and if you look at the St. Pete Beach example it didn't work out so well over there so I'm not sure what you might be able to do to head that off during the legislative session it's likely to be well it's going to be on the ballot, so if there's some alternative that the legislature can propose, that would probably be very helpful. And Volusia County hasn't really taken a stand on it, but I could tell you if I were taking a vote today, um, they would be opposed to Amendment 4. Um, you know, we're, we're all in a situation that we've been elected to office to do the right thing and to look at zoning cases and, and, and so on, and I, I believe that we are doing the right thing in Volusia County and the Central Florida area. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if there's another around the table. Yes, Ms. Uh Thank you very much. Panel, thank you for, for being here. Um, I heard a couple of you mention it, and um, it, it's, it's, it would be my job to bring it up. Let's go back to collaboration in regards to uh, space and a, and, a, a, and, and a viable commercial space market. Um, uh, space has for a long time been seen as a, as a space coast issue, a Brevard County issue. But I think that it's becoming uh, very clear to the surrounding counties that you represent that the loss of, uh, of 7,000 direct jobs and potentially an another 30,000 indirect jobs will greatly affect our region, um, not to mention the state of Florida. Um, it's going to be critical that uh, each of your counties and, and surrounding areas um, see space as a hometown problem. Um, uh, I will tell you that a 13.5% unemployment rate in Brevard directly affects each of you and your municipalities. Um, uh, you can imagine now if your budgets are tight how it will be when another 30,000 hit the unemployment rolls. Um, so I'd like to hear um, from the panel uh, your plans and collaboration and, and your willingness to participate um, as we try to mitigate these job losses that uh, are coming with the grounding of the shuttle fleet. Gentlemen. Well, let me speak for Volusia County because we border Brevard County, and uh, I want you to know how important the space industry is to Volusia County. We have about 20,000 people every day um, migrating down into the Brevard County area for jobs and related to the space industry. So there's no um, you know, way that we can do anything other than promote the space industry down there, and we will continue to. I, I, I'm sure that there's more that we can do. I'm going to have to look at that on a regional basis with the Congress of Regional Leaders and as well as our uh, local counties. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, and your statement has pretty much said it all in this room. Every one of us need to be concerned with those jobs in Brevard County, and I don't know what type of formal process we might take, but I certainly would be willing to step up and be one of those leaders on the issue. Absolutely. Well, I spoke previously about it. I, I support it 100%. It's the original high-tech industry in Florida, and so we need to learn from it, especially as we develop Medical City, um, and we need to protect it. It's an existing industry. We need to protect it. Please join me in thanking the lead-off panel for their fine job. Thank you, gentlemen. Outstanding job. Thank you so much. You've just heard an excellent discussion on the drivers of business climate and competitiveness, and then also civic and government systems. We now move to the next two key drivers, innovation and economic development and infrastructure and growth management. And we will have three panelists. Uh, first, let me introduce the uh, panelist, uh, Lieutenant Governor of Florida, Jeff Kotkamp. For purposes of our discussion today, the Lieutenant Governor is here on behalf of the organization which he chairs, Space Florida. Space Florida was created in 2007 to strengthen Florida's position as the global leader in aerospace research, investment, exploration, and commerce. And Lieutenant Governor is an outstanding spokesperson for economic development. Stanley Payne is here as the CEO of the Canaveral Port Authority, and he is also the chairman of the board of directors of the Florida Ports Council, FPC, which is the professional association of all 14 of Florida's deep water seaports. He is also a founding member of the Central Florida Partnership. And our final panelist is Janet Petro, uh, the Deputy Director of the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Ms. Petro is also a captain in the United States Army and is a graduate of West Point, the United States Military Academy, and is an outstanding spokesperson for our space program. Facilitating this discussion will be Fred Kittinger, Associate Vice President of the University of Central Florida, and please join me in thanking our panelists and our facilitator. Okay, thank you, Mr. Linhart. Fred has put the pieces on the proverbial chessboard and give a little context from which our questions come today. Let us remember that in a 21st century global competitive market, we probably perhaps need to start looking at changing our ideas and notions about economic development and what sort of systems and incentives need to be put into place when it comes to attracting and expanding and growing the jobs of tomorrow. Now, economists tell us that the two driving factors that will determine success in the next century will be innovation and entrepreneurship, innovation, entrepreneurship. And two contributors to those two factors are talent and research. And we have some best talent we have in the state of Florida represented by this panel here today. So let's get with the questions. Governor Kotkamp, we're going to start right with you on Space Florida issues. What are the key infrastructure needs that the space industry has to attract and grow companies here to Florida? Infrastructure needs. Uh, well, first and foremost, you've got to look, like you said, to the future and innovation. If you look uh, where Florida uh, is, we're in a very good position. Look where space is going. Uh, and of course, we, we support fully uh, the mission of NASA. We believe, and we've spoken out uh, very forcefully, that we believe uh, we should go forward with the Constellation program, that this country should continue to be the leader in space exploration. It drives innovation. And so uh, that's something we, we believe very strongly. But also, we have to look to commercial space. We, we see that as being a, a major component of the future of space. And so we've worked hard to develop uh, commercial launch complexes, uh, bringing SpaceX to Florida, developing Launch Complex 36, which the legislature uh, has funded and, and been great leaders on this delegation, uh, have been great leaders in, in the development of commercial space here in Florida, and, uh, and also uh, making sure that we uh, expand our Department of Defense launches here in Florida so that we diversify our space portfolio and, uh, and continue to, to look to the future of space. So the, the, the commercial launch complex is a key component of the infrastructure. You know, having the Kennedy Space Center in Florida is a tremendous advantage for us. Uh, when we go out and try to bring companies here to Florida, they know we have the best workforce in the world uh, right here in Florida. All of these are great assets, uh, but probably one of our greatest assets is this delegation that understands 
uh, that we're entering a new era in space, and they've been very, uh, very insightful and in, in, in really pushed the envelope in making sure that we continue to be leaders. Okay. Well, thank you, Governor. And speaking, along, uh, speaking about some of our great assets, Larry, you represent one of what I think are known as the greatest assets to our economy, but also perhaps one of the most uh, uh, known or secret assets to this community. The port's been always a big contributor to our economy. And I'm wondering for this audience here today, what opportunities exist for the port authority to continue to contribute to our economy here in Central Florida? And what do you need to help fulfill that potential? Well, let me first uh, acknowledge one of my commissioners, Mac McClouth, is here. Uh, Mac has been associated with the port when the port was a fishing village 40 years ago. Mac? Now, to put things in perspective, we're not a fishing village anymore. The Canaveral Port Authority is the third largest port authority in the state in terms of operating revenue. I bet you didn't know that. We don't collect taxes, but we could. We operate as a business. We have revenues, we have costs, and what we have left over is plowed into our infrastructure. It works well for us. Our direct economic impact on Central Florida is $1.6 billion and 25,000 jobs and growing. Our most recent activity over just the last couple of years has seen $234 million in construction projects, generating nearly 6,000 jobs, $127 million in wages from construction and expansion of operations at a time when our area desperately needed it. More importantly for today, we are Orlando's outlet to the sea not simply because of supporting tourism and the four 4,000 passenger ships we'll have home ported at Port Canaveral uh, for our cruise business in 2012, but in 2006 we had 600,000 tons of lumber come through Port Canaveral that made its way right down the beach line into Orlando. We're about to open a $120 million privately financed oil terminal, an idea that had its genesis in 2004 when you remember Central Florida nearly ran out of gasoline and aviation fuel. That won't happen again. So my point today is don't forget about Port Canaveral. We are part of Central Florida. We are part of Orlando. We're your outlet to the sea. We are your partner. Thank you, Larry. And your next door neighbor literally is NASA. And Janet, like a lot of folks here, I grew up in Orlando and I've always just been fascinated with astronauts, with rockets going to the sky, with those beautiful night launches that just make the heavens uh, glow a light. But there's also a, a serious business side to NASA, especially when it comes to research and development. So the question for you is what does the amount of R&D investment impact NASA's ability to remain vital to our economy? And where should the focus be for new investment? Does it come from the feds, state, local, or a combination? Um, let me start out by saying that uh, research and development has always been a very integral part of uh, NASA as an agency. And um, one of the key messages that our new administrator, Charlie Bolden, has uh, consistently said in uh, many of his uh, speeches to uh, uh, public audiences and also to us as uh, senior leadership at NASA is that one of his primary goals is to become the preeminent research and development agency for our nation. He wants us to be the place where innovative technical solutions are identified and where we can address operational requirements and um, improve safety and reduce uh, life cycle costs. Now many of you may think of uh, the Kennedy Space Center as merely a operational center. You mentioned uh, uh, the launch and landing of the space shuttle and other rockets and how beautiful it is. But a little known fact about Kennedy is that we rank number two in the agency in the number of patents that we have applied for in uh, 2008. So we do have a number of uh, uh, research and development activities that go on within us. Um, funding for us here at KSC has been about $30 million a year in R&D uh, initiatives. So it's, it's, it's quite a bit. We've partnered very closely with the uh, state of Florida in a state-of-the-art research facility. Many of you may have heard of the Space Life Sciences uh, facility. Where, where many of the scientists have the ability to use those uh, facilities and perform research within the center. 
that facility, it's hoped uh, uh, that in the future it can be the uh, cornerstone for where experiments um, will be processed for the uh, space station. I'm sure many of you know that the, um, me all of the hardware that processed through the uh, Kennedy Space Center that went to go construct the International Space Station, and it's now known as a National Laboratory. So um, we have been an integral part of that entire process. Uh, last month, I had the opportunity and the privilege to go up to uh, Tallahassee and talk to a biotechnology caucus that was sponsored by Senator Altman and talk to, to many of you about the initiatives that we have within Kennedy Space Center and our agency in terms of um, R&D initiatives. And those included things, uh, the research on vaccines um, for salmonella and for um, um, streptococcus, uh, which is uh, for, lung, for uh, promotion of lung diseases and put that. Um, we had many inventions. Uh, Rescue Pod was one of the primary ones that we developed in conjunction with the, uh, with the Army and with uh, other corporate partnerships. That, de that medical device is now used by our astronauts as they're returning back from uh, space to help them reacquaint themselves with gravity. But it's also used by emergency medical services personnel today for people who are undergoing um, breathing problems or cardiac arrest. So many of these inventions um, that, we, that have been throughout the uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center and the agency as a whole um, help promote uh, uh, our better quality of life down here on Earth. And so I think R&D is integral. It's important. It's what we need to continue to do. As uh, Lieutenant Governor indicated, it's something we need to focus a little more on so we can diversify our portfolio in the area. I think we are well po uh, postured for this um, with our partnerships that we have established with the state of Florida through Space Florida, with the Economic Development Commissions that we've um, established we work very closely with. Thank We're going to stay on the space theme, but Governor, I'm going to bounce the ball back to you. Florida, for so many years, historically, we've seen ourselves as the epicenter for space travel and exploration. But we know there's competition out there. Who do you see as our competition for the next 20 years? That's a very good question. We're, uh, we're certainly uh, competing with more than states. We're competing with countries. It's one of the reasons we've been so forceful um, in our position with the White House, because we don't believe uh, we can take a back seat and take time off and allow Russia or China to become the preeminent country in space. That has been the position of not just the state, but this country. And going back, you know, I had a chance to talk to, to Buzz Aldrin about this, and he said, you know, we could do nothing, not really an option, because if we do nothing, then we, we cede, we concede that another country will become the leader in space. We could go back to the moon, but we've already done that, or we could go to Mars. To do that isn't just about national pride that you can do that. It drives the innovation that you're talking about. You know, there, are, there are more than 3,000 products that we all use every day that were initially developed as part of the space program. It drives innovation, technology, expands markets, creates jobs. Uh, you know, being a leader in space is about far more than just being able to do it. And just to piggyback onto something Janet was talking about to tell you how it really is happening in Florida right now. Again, at the Life Science Center, recognizing uh, if we do go to Mars, that's a six-month flight there. It's a six-month flight back, and they recognize that that astronauts would have to grow some food, uh, some plants uh, on that flight as part of the overall uh, ability to have food. And they're using LED lights, experimenting with them to uh, grow bigger fruits and vegetables. But beyond that, uh, they are actually manipulating the color of these LED lights and they're increasing the antioxidants in these fruits and vegetables by 40 to 60 percent. So think about the, the future uh, possibilities of this meeting, your home, your business, your schools, your, your buildings, having LED lights where we change the color of the lights and improve our health. That's not far away and that's technology that's being developed as part of the space program here in Florida, but it has future applications far beyond that. And uh, you know, that's just one microcosm of, of why this research and development and continuing to be a leader in space is so important. The, the future economy is the innovation economy, and being a leader in space drives that. So if we want to take a few years off because we think we can't afford it, uh, we're going to see ourselves left uh, in, in, the, uh, you know, in the dust from some other companies, uh, countries that are waiting to jump into the fray. Uh, and I'll just mention one other thing. By the way, uh, 
space is a huge component of national defense. So, I, you know, it's critically important that we think about that too. Uh, we don't think we can afford to not be, continue to be the leader in space exploration. And, and I hope that uh, as this debate continues in Washington, they will recognize there's too much at, at stake not to continue to be the leader. Governor, I share your same passion. I do not want us to be the Avis of space travel. I want us to maintain being the Hertz of space travel here. Uh, Stan Payne, back to you. We've heard about collaboration in the earlier panel, and we've talked a little bit about it on this panel as well. When it comes to the port, what are some of the state entities or regional entities that you all need to collaborate with? Well, we're planning for growth right now. Uh, we grow as a port conservatively. We're a business-based port. We will grow as far as our revenues will take us. So if we ask for your help in developing our infrastructure, you can be assured that we really need it. And those funds are going to be well spent as an investment in the future of Central Florida. We need help from the legislature as a group in Florida, the ports do. Port Canaveral needs help from the legislature to make sure that just because we are conservative in our approach to development, we don't get overlooked. And I think that happened last year. We lost some FDOT funding. It was only $5 million. $5 million is a lot of money to us as we plan conservatively for our future. We're going to go about our business. We're going to do it quietly as a business. We ask that you make sure that we don't get overlooked. And I was told not to bring props, but I did bring one prop today. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, this is not the construction of the world of Harry Potter that you're about to see, but this is actually the view outside my window of port operations and construction going on last week. Good. Excellent. Ms. Petro, if you want to bring a Saturn rocket over for a prop, we, we would welcome that as well. Uh, Ms. Petro, who has the greatest ability to influence NASA's future? Does it come from the policymakers or does it come from the private sector? I would say um, it has to come from a combination of them. And I think one of the most recent examples of that is the Augustine panel. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that that mem membership came from not only policymakers, but also from uh, members of the private industry. So I think that going forward, it's going to have to be a uh, combination of both. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a note. Uh, you know, NASA has not been given new direction yet from the uh, current administration. So we are on the path we are on. And until we are given um, new direction, that's what we're going to do. Obviously, if uh, the direction is given that we need to partner more or spend more dollars on our commercial partners, then that's going to be our focus. Um, one example where we as an agency are already doing this and, and also locally um, where it's, it's vis will be very visible to um, all of you next year is our partnership with um, SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX recently uh, obtained a launch date from the range uh, for next February 2010 and um, that's part of our uh, commercial orbital transportation system or COTS program um, sponsored by the agency where SpaceX was one of two programs um, put on contract to um, demonstrate between 2008 and 2010 the ability to uh, bring cargo um, and deliver it to the International Space Station. So we're very proud of that um, commercial uh, endeavor and also um, we wish them um, continued success. I think everyone probably knows that the uh, end of the space shuttle program is imminent. We are now in the final year of that program and um, we have five remaining um, flights left. So this is a time not only of challenge, but one of opportunity. And so I think we need to transform ourselves um, as an agency between that program and the program of the future, and we look forward to doing that. Right. Thank you. Now, I think the panelists would love to take a break from answering my questions. We'd like to entertain some questions from our policymakers. Representative. Thank you. Um, appreciate y'all being here. And, and I think all of us who have been around Central Florida for any length of time fully appreciate the launch capability that the CAPE enjoys. My question is, what can we do in the name of diversification of our economy to, to retain those R&D projects and, and let, them, let that area become a manufacturing area? And, and to, what can we do to attract companies 
that are building the launch vehicles to build them here. Instead of us just being a pass-through, uh, what can we do to attract the companies to come here and, and fully develop and commercialize the, the new innovative things that we come up with? And what can we do to attract the ones that will, um, that will manufacture these launch vehicles that we're shooting? Well, I'll, I'll jump in first just because that's kind of a tricky question for Janet to have to jump into, but she may have something to add to it. But I can tell you, we've, uh, Representative, we've had these discussions uh, with NASA simply recognizing, obviously, there are a lot of turf wars in congressional delegations as well, uh, but uh, everybody's looking for efficiencies. And so one of our pitches has been, look, we've got uh, the world-class workforce right here in Central Florida that's capable of doing far more than simply launching. And from a cost efficiency standpoint, it would make more sense uh, to include those that are going to launch a vehicle as part of the overall construction rather than constructing it somewhere else, transporting it here, and then launching. So that's been our, our pitch. Uh, we have had some discussions uh, with the folks at jo from Johnson uh, on that very topic. But as I said, there are some, some turf wars involved here. But I think that's the best possible pitch is, look, everybody's got to find efficiencies and, and stretch uh, dollars further. And that, to me, is, is one of the, the common sense ways to approach this, to bring some of that work here to the Sunshine State. I would like to add a few things on the, um, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, uh, our workforce and the, the highly talented uh, workforce that we have at the Kennedy Space Center, which I um, truly consider a, a, a true treasure. But in addition to this talented workforce, at the end of the um, shuttle program, we are going to have a number of uh, facilities and other technical capabilities, laboratories, et cetera, that won't be at full uh, operating at full capacity. And so um, as part of attracting those businesses here, um, we, we can offer that up. And one of the things we did at uh, the Kennedy Space Center was uh, we, we restructured and reorganized a little bit and created a um, what we call our Center for Planning and Business Development. In other words, a front door for external entities and other organizations who either wanted to do business with, uh, with us at the center or who wanted to um, um, utilize our capabilities. And we consolidated it into one organization, one front door office to make it easier for businesses and other organizations or perhaps other government agencies to call us and take advantage of the, um, the assets that we have that uh, at Kennedy Space Center that won't be utilized at the end of the space shuttle program. I also wanted to mention one of um, Space Florida's main tenants is this uh, supply chain management, which actually um, uh, includes and brings that, you know, encourages a business. And, and we at NASA has wor have worked very closely with uh, Frank DeBello and Space Florida so that we understand what the assets are available and what we need to do to attract those. So I think we'll work. We have two more questions that are going to bring us to a close. First, Representative Dorworth. I noticed in the title for this uh, panel, it's Innovation, Economic Development, Infrastructure, and Growth Management. And that's a great question. Mr. Pan, I enjoyed listening to you discuss the economic impact of, of Cape Canaveral. But it occurs to me to, to go to that last place with our current growth management laws, putting together something like a Cape Canaveral or a Disney World would be basically impossible in this state uh, under our current framework. What suggestions do you guys have for us bringing future huge economic in impact projects like that within our current framework? Opportunity, but what are the obstacles? You're growing. <laughs> yes, we, we are growing. Uh, we are growing um, because we have been set up as a special district of the state that allows us to control our own growth. Um, but we do it in a measured way. And the thought that be, because we have the freedom, we're not going to exercise it appropriately is simply wrong. Uh, we have exercised it, I believe, conservatively, as I've talked about before, but building a foundation and moving forward. So I think if you want to look at a model, uh, Port Canaveral is a good model for how you can have that kind of flexibility and also provide for growth, but that you don't need the kind of restrictions that sometimes are being talked about. Thank you. Other comments? Representative Thompson. Governor Kotkamp, I have a question regarding how we might involve more segments of our community in entrepreneurship and innovation. I know the state has an office of 
supply a diversity that certifies businesses, but I'm told by many of those businesses that beyond certification, very little happens. And as we move into this new economy, what would be your thoughts in terms of how to increase participation of individuals who have been underrepresented? Well, I guess a couple of things. First, uh, we have to think not just short term, but long term. So I think in economic development, uh, we should be viewing this entire thing as a continuum from early learning through our K through 12 system, through our community colleges and our universities to our economic development efforts. So looking at the biotech, the aerospace, the alternative energy, renewable energies that, uh, companies that we want to bring here and the jobs that we want to bring, these high tech, high wage jobs which will raise the standard of living in Florida, uh, looking to that continuum, what are some of the ways we can plant seeds uh, so that we have children that are interested in getting into these economic development areas. That's a long-term view. One of the ideas, have more schools like Goldsboro Elementary School where children learn in an applied setting where they have a simulated Johnson Space Center, a simulated uh, inside of the space shuttle, a simulated surface of the moon where they get in space suits and uh, do experiments on the surface of the moon. So you've got to believe uh, regardless of the background or the color of their skin, these children are going to be so excited to be a scientist and engineers and, and researchers. And, and that's one thing we have to do in economic development so that we have a workforce to compete in this global innovation economy. Uh, as to your point, you know, I think we can be more aggressive in providing opportunities for every segment. I know that, that the governor's office certainly makes every effort to do that. Uh, but it's to make sure that we have businesses out there that have the skills necessary and, and the bottom line is workforce. So we have two more tools here which a lot of states don't have beyond K-12. Our community colleges, our, our state colleges, they're so uh, flexible in their ability to retrain workers so that a company that wants to get into one of these innovation uh, businesses can very rapidly uh, retrain their employees to be competitive in that area and, and bring work uh, through the company and of course uh, our universities. Uh, when you have the, the, the combination of our state colleges and our universities, that is an advantage that we have to develop the workforce uh, even greater. But that's, that's really got to be uh, the focus uh, with any company is to make sure that they can offer uh, the trained workforce necessary to take on some of these innovation opportunities. We see several hands open, but I'm starting to get the hook from our handler, so I'm going to ask for one or two quick questions and one or two very economical responses. Uh, Representative Soto, I think you had yours up first. Thank you. Uh, with regards to the Constellation program, uh, the, they were awarded to two out-of-state out contractors, but there's a possibility that they may still use the CAPE. What is the status of those negotiations, and what can we do to make sure that at least some of the Constellation program remains here in the state of Florida? Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm just not sure um, when you when you say the Constellation program it's the um, follow on program to the uh, shuttle where there's a development of um, both rockets and um, a crew uh, vehicle as well as a, a lunar lander. There's um, a whole lot more than two contracts. So I'm not really sure, but I, but I can tell you some of the things um, that we've done is we brought the uh, uh, crew exploration uh, vehicle manufacturer. Um, back to one of our um, one of the historic places where the Apollo was processed uh, in the ONC, our operations and checkout building, and and uh, we partnered with the state of Florida and Lockheed Martin um, for 35 million and brought that there. So that was one example where we brought the um, the uh, uh, work to uh, Florida and in specific to the Kennedy Space Center. I'm not really sure about the two you're talking about. You're talking about SpaceX and Orbital Sciences Corporation? Correct. Okay, that's that's that uh, COTS program, Commercial Orbital Transportation System, and SpaceX is launching from Cape, uh, uh, from Cape Canaveral here. Um, they're going to be processing, doing some of the processing of that vehicle here. Um, Orbital, <coughs> the other one, is going to be launching out of uh, Wallops, and that's probably the one you're um, referring to. Um, I know Space Florida is continually working for Orbital. They're going to do their demonstration flights from Wallops, um, but I don't think the final decision on where their resupply operations are going to, are going to occur. That wasn't very okay. Christine threatening to take the air out of my tires. One last one. Rosen McKee. It seems to me that, um, and maybe this is for Ms. Petro or, or Lieutenant Governor, but it seems to me very frustrating that we're not going to be able to achieve um, 
I mean, great direction until we have direction from the administration on what on, on what the utilization is going to be. Um, and, and I would think that dri that big chunk drives where we're going to um, try to either grab new business or, or otherwise full otherwise fill the uh, facilities or whatever however we're going to otherwise utilize the, the the space and the talent um, what can we do I guess as a delegation to me this needs to be one of the critical um, initiatives of this Central Florida delegation what can we do as a delegation to either encourage that decision or that direction <coughs> or or somehow lobby for the direction that we think ought to be or, or have there, has there been efforts um, to, to deal with that issue? There have been, and I think that we can all work together to continue to support our congressional delegation and, and be a very loud and clear and unified voice uh, on this issue. But uh, frankly, uh, whatever direction uh, they decide to go with NASA, that cannot continue to be the only part of our portfolio. We have to be very aggressive in commercial space. That's something that, that you as, as a delegation as an, and as a legislature has done uh, to, to help us develop Launch Complex 36, to help us start laying that foundation so that Florida can continue to be the leader in commercial space as well, and we will continue to try and bring more Department of Defense work here as well. So by diversifying the portfolio, uh, that is how we can continue to move forward regardless of what the White House decides. The worst thing I could do for my job security is to cut off lawmakers who want to ask questions. So I'm going to ask a couple of folks who have been raising their hands, if you can go ahead and make your question more in the form of a statement, plant the seeds with our panelists. We won't have any feedback or answers, but plant the seeds with them. I think Representative Horner, you've been very patient. Mike? Well, I'm going to disobey your uh, suggestion if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, everyone in this, around this table is supportive of uh, the commercialization of space. i just like to know specifically this session, besides maybe I think there's a road project out there, what specifically this session do we need to do, what can we do to help specifically that, that you want to see happen, not kind of the grandiose terms, what can we do this session to assist in the commercialization of space? Today they're the bosses. Have a well, I, you know, we've started down the road of Launch Complex 36. We've got to complete that task. Uh, we have to work with this, this use of the Life Science Center and, and hopefully be able to develop that into a, a really uh, growing dynamic economic development project for us. Those are two areas uh, that we've already started to work on. We can continue to fund that so that we can bring uh, more work in the Florida. So the two specific opportunities right there for the legislature. Specific ask, any other responses? I, I would just like to say uh, consider everything you can do to take care of our workforce. They are, um, as I said before, treasured asset. Um, they are, are highly skilled, highly talented, highly dedicated. I, I'm very privileged to be able to work with that passionate. So anything you can do to um, assist in finding or helping our workforce to um, stay in the area, of course, and uh, uh, find meaningful work would be um, would be my pleasure. I, I, I'm going to take a few sentences to say that there'll be legislation introduced, as I understand it, to increase the funding for ports that traditionally has been about $15 million a year. Uh, actually, the legislation in the past says they can go down to $8 million uh, in times when it needs to. Traditionally, it's been 15. We'd like to see that increase to $25 million per year for the ports. Now, imagine that. There are 14 deep water ports in this state sharing $25 million. But that's what we'll be asking for. Um, there are three pieces of legislation that we have to band together um, and ensure that um, we bring home for the Central Florida delegation. That includes a, c a commercial launch zone creation, expansion of the Life Sciences Building, um, and uh, an R&D tax credit, um, all of which will um, help expand our commercial space infrastructure. Um, it was asked, what can we do to support NASA? Um, as much as I love NASA and its manned space flight and all it does for the country and, and, and the state, NASA is simply the staple. It's, it's what brought a space industry here. Um, um, that is for the feds to decide. We are to go to safespace.us and do all we can. But the key is we cannot rely on NASA to be the space state. We must expand our commercial enterprise those three pieces of legislation help, and I will show you how it helps. Over the past few years, this state has made three major investments um, in space. Um, they built the Life Sciences Building, which is the R&D hub of NASA. We need to expand that. Um, um, we need to make the space station um, a, a um, 
uh, a place where R&D is done, um, and we can do that by bringing in private companies onto uh, NASA soil to do their research for the country there. We invested and, and rebuilt a launch pad, which attracted SpaceX um, um, and, and all the jobs that they bring. And um, we renovated the ONC building, which for the first time in Florida's history, it, it, the result of re renovating that building, we are actually building a spacecraft. The Orion space capsule will be built in uh, Florida, and it's the first time the, the state known for putting men into space will actually build a piece of the rocket. That's a huge piece, and that was a very minor investment from the state, but it brought that manufacturing plant uh, to Florida. Um, and Representative Dorworth talked about, um, you know, we couldn't build a port today based on our current laws, and he's right. Because of our current law structure, uh, Virgin Galactica, um, which is the, the first tourism in space, I know, I'm sorry, is going to build their, 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 um, their city in the desert of New Mexico. And I will tell you, if you're rich enough to fly to space, uh, you don't want to be a tourist to leave from the desert of New Mexico. You want to leave from the land of I Dream of Genie. We must bring this company here. We, we must uh, convince SpaceX that building a rocket in California and driving it by train past four of our biggest competitors is a bad idea. Let's build it here, and it's going to take a major sweeping law change to do so. Good note to close on. Ladies and gentlemen, these three individuals represent the industries, the companies, and the workforce that are so critical to our economy. Please join me in welcoming and thanking them for their time. Thank you. Thank you for that very informative discussion. That was really interesting. I also want to acknowledge uh, Senator Altman and Representative Popple serve as representatives of the legislature on Space Florida's board. And Representative uh, Workman, might you want to make a pitch for the Space Caucus? Uh, I think you just did. Uh, I, I think I just did. Uh, obviously, uh, the, 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 the uh, Florida legislature has realized space is not a provided problem. They've banded together over 40 members across uh, party lines, across uh, district lines, have band together and to form the Florida Space Caucus. Uh, and its job is to do exactly what I talked about today. Thank you. Well, we've heard about business climate and competitiveness. We've heard about civic and government systems. We just heard about innovation and economic development and infrastructure and growth management. Our final topics are quality of life and talent and education. This panel will feature three outstanding leaders. Tony Jenkins, Central Florida Market President for Blue Cross Blue Shield, a leader in Florida's health industry. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield and its subsidiaries serve more than 8.6 million people. Mr. Jenkins is also a founding board member of the Central Florida Partnership. Uh, next, I've always wanted to uh, meet Smokey Robinson. I'm actually serving on the uh, board of the partnership with Smokey Robinson. That's Captain Harry Robinson, who is the commanding officer of the Naval Air Warfare Center Training Systems Division located right next door at the Central Florida Research Park next door to UCF. He's a naval aviator, na naval aviator of distinction. He has over 4,000 flight hours, and in the cockpit, they call him Smokey Robinson. Uh, Captain Robinson serves on the Central Florida Partnership Board. And then finally, the President and CEO of the Tampa Bay Partnership, Stu Rogel. Uh, Stu Rogel uh, is the leader of the super region by example, the, the Tampa Bay Partnership. Uh, that became the genesis of helping us to be inspired to create the Central Florida Partnership. The Tampa Bay Partnership was founded in 1994, and it is the regional economic development organization for the seven-county Tampa Bay region. Uh, leading this discussion, uh, our conversation will be facilitator Margot Knight, the president and CEO of United Arts of Central Florida. As many of you know, United Arts works to enhance the quality and variety of cultural experiences available throughout Lake Orange, Osceola, and Seminole counties. And since its inception in 1989, United Arts has invested over $107 million in local cultural organizations and cultural education. Join me in thanking these leaders as they begin this part of our program. Thank you.